Hello, my name is Tina Vaittinen and I'm the PI in the research project called patproject.online. This is a social scientific project based at Tampere University Finland and it's funded by the Academy of Finland and Gonet Foundation. The aim of our project is no less but to conceptualize and develop holistically sustainable continent care globally and locally. Today I will spend 10 minutes to try and summarize really, really quickly what sustainable continent care is, why it matters and what we can do to minimize the waste produced by absorbent products. Before I start, I want to express my deepest gratitude to both the EAU and the WFIPP, Lynn and Eamon specifically, for raising the issue of sustainable continent care to the agenda of the EAU. This is huge and it's really, really important. When we started our project three years ago, the concept of sustainable continent care did not really exist. Now, three years later, we not only talk about it, but talk about it in arenas like this, where sustainability questions can be introduced to the practices of medicine. This round table may be just the beginning for greater development, but I do think, but I do think it is a historical beginning or the same. Why does sustainable continent care matter in and for sustainable societies? If urinary incontinence for a country it would be the third largest in the world, they say. 400 million people in the world live with urinary incontinence, 6% of those under 40 live with fecal incontinence, postpartum urinary incontinence affects every third person who has given birth and every, every tenth birth giver is left with fecal leakages. And as you know, in the field of urology, many forms of incontinence can actually be treated and even cured. But to do so, they would need to be diagnosed and we would need to know about those treatments. And as it is at the moment, very often we don't actually treat the conditions, but the solution is to manage incontinence with an incontinence pad. And the reason for this is, of course, the taboo that uh, remains in uh, that and the stigma that is attached to incontinence issues, that there is a massive silent pe silence. People don't necessarily seek for help. And when they do in primary health care, they don't necessarily know about the treatments that are available or the diagnostics or even the types of incontinence that exist. So the silence around incontinence actually even abides to healthcare sector in, 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 many, in many fields of healthcare sectors, in different healthcare sectors. And nevertheless, at the same time, it is also argued that the future is adult incontinence. And this sentence is from a market report outlook uh, uh, in a journal, Nonviolence Industry, written by Tara Olivo. And uh, according to the sister, the adult, uh, adult incontinence pad uh, uh, markets are growing each year and really quite steadily. And in 2021, it was estimated to be at 14.2 billion US dollars. And this, of course, not only means that we use a lot of money in these products in our public healthcare systems, and of course, private households use a lot of money to them, but for each pad used there, it ends up as waste. And it is waste that is not compostable. It takes 500 years for an adult incontinence pad to compost. In OECD countries alone, about 5% of municipal waste comes from adult incontinence pad. And this figure comes from an article written by Maribel Velasco Perez and her colleagues in Mexico, which deals with waste management and environmental impact of absorbent hygiene products. And they have uh, shown, it's, they have really detailed statistics on, on how this waste is, is managed in different parts of the world. And in many parts of the world, it, or in some parts of the world, we used use the waste to produce energy through incineration. And, but then we also still put them in landfills and illegal dump sites in different parts of the world. And this is a massive, massive environmental problem. And even if we use incineration, it is still a climate change. It, still, it still has massive climate impacts. So something needs to be done. But what is sustainable continence care then? When we talk about sustainability, we need to remember that in order for something to be holistically sustainable, it needs to be not only economically sustainable, but also socially and ecologically sustainable. 
economically sustainable continence care would mean that it is cost effective, but it needs to be cost effective, not only in terms of this one particular treatment, but it needs to be cost effective holistically in terms of its short term and long term impact on for individuals as well as for the public in the public economy. And it needs to account for the total costs. It needs to account for the direct cost, indirect costs, intangible costs, and external costs. So really, it needs to be account for the costs that that can that come from the field of social and ecological sustainability, um, or can be avoided for by some making something socially and ecologically sustainable. So socially sustainable continence care would mean that it is equal and equitable, it is accessible and it is ethical. Ecologically sustainable continence care would mean the reduction of waste and climate impact of continence products and continence care in general. We need to take into, we need to learn life cycle thinking, not only in terms of producing the products, but also in terms of producing the services and producing the care. We need to think about the what happens when we, when we do care this way, what kind of material impacts does it have on the world short term and long term? We need to think about wider infrastructures, technologies and logistics. We need to think beyond healthcare practices alone. But where are we now then? Some examples and not so happy examples actually. At the moment, in more or less in all societies, there is a massive lack of preventative care of continents and also inadequate rehabilitation of incontinence issues, it, where it, particularly with con incontinence issues that could be cured even by through say physiotherapy we don't do this the solutions are there but then we don't do it uh, there is lack of and one reason for this is that we're not doing it is that there is lack of knowledge of incontinence and continence issues in primary health care and then when the incontinence cannot be cured and then there is need for products the choice of products in societies is not tailored for individual needs we use wrong sizes we use we use wrong absorbencies, we use wrong products. And this is, in short, wasteful use of resources. And again, it has a massive, massive environmental impact and things that could be fixed, but we don't. Then we design, we build hospitals, we build care homes, so places where incontinence actually is relative, quite prevalent, but we build these infrastructures without taking into account continence issues and toileting. We don't account, we built these places without thinking like what, how does waste management and log logistics, where, where is the storage base and so on. So really we need to start thinking about sustainable continence co care also when we build spaces to live in for people who have continence issues. Uh, then, of course, inadequate staffing in care has massive impacts because then it means inadequate health with toileting needs, for instance, which means more need of material resources. Uh, there are problems in public procurement of continence technologies because people who do the procurement don't actually know about all those technologies and why there needs to be a wide selection of products and you can't really save money by limiting the choice of products, for instance. And uh, also some international standardizations may be incentivized in the industry uh, to make sustainable innovations. Uh, and finally, there is very little attention paid to, incon paid to incontinence care and continence care in low resource settings and in, in the majority world in global health politics and in discussions of sustainable development goals and so on and so forth. But okay, what can urology do towards sustainable continence care in urology. And this is something that I really look forward to hearing what the panel actually discusses. Um, um, but I have some tips. <laughs> so first of all, sustainable continence care must account for the multiple realities of incontinence and multiple realities of continence care. We need to remember that although urology is a field where there is a lot of knowledge about cure, especially cure of incontinence, um, urological practice actually provides only a partial view of what incontinence is and what continence care is. And this means, well, and nevertheless, um, when we develop sustainable continence care, the urologists actually have a massive role, really, really crucial 
role to play. And this is because you guys have power and you have influence within the healthcare system. So use that power and influence to develop sustainable continence care. I'm going to take one more minute. I'm going to be, go one more minute over time. So respect all healthcare practitioners and re respect what they can do for, for sustainable continence care. Bridge the gap between knowledge in primary healthcare and specialized care. Make sure that they know in primary healthcare what you can do so that people have access to diagnostics and cure. Use your voice to amplify the knowledges of those who other those knowledges and skills of those who otherwise are not heard in the development of health systems. And I'm even talking about care providers uh, and caregivers in, in, in care homes, for instance, nurses and so on. Uh, listen and learn about what these other professionals do already in developing sustainable continence care. So and finally. We need to remember that better continuous care for people means better care of the planet and the economy. And this is a really, really good political message to take to any tables you ever sit in. Bye. <laughs>